Hello, my name is Marilyn Anders. I'm a registered dietitian. Dr. Umbach has asked me to do a presentation for you that you would understand the importance of nutrition with the bariatric surgery. As a registered dietitian, I have a degree in nutrition and dietetics and have also been practicing for over 25 years, have worked with many patients with the bariatric surgery. So therefore, the information I will present to you will be in conjunction with what you're about to do with this new surgery. It's an exciting adventure and we look forward to having you progress. One of the most important things you need to have in your arsenal in order to prevent the weight from ever coming back is the use of a journal. After the surgery, a journal will be an invaluable tool for you. What will you put in this journal? You will talk about what food you ate that day. Why? Because it is so important that you get the amount of protein you need. If you do not get the amount of protein you need, you could have trouble with hair loss, many nutritional complications. Also a journal can help you keep track of your exercise. It's very hard for us to exercise on a daily basis. We've all fought that battle. But by logging it in, it keeps you on the up and up. Also, the most important thing about the surgery is that now we've given you a window. You are now going to lose weight rapidly. We are going to fix your stomach to the size of an Easter egg or a small banana, depending on the surgery we're doing. And that's done in a very short period of time. But until we get a handle on the feelings, what caused you to get there? How did you go from being a baby that ate normally to all of a sudden continually eating past your feelings of satiety? So getting to know your feelings is real important, and that's what a journal can do. I have worked with many patients over the years, and one of my favorite stories that I will go back to over and over is my patient who was 700 pounds who is now down to 350, and actually 50 of it is skin. He has finally learned that the feelings that have caused him to put the weight on were feelings of every time he was anxious, he ate. Every time he saw a commercial on TV, he ate. This journal is going to help you figure out how you got to this point. So the journal is going to be invaluable. Keeping this journal, at least in the initial part of the surgery, after the surgery, is very, very important. And then setting goals. And we'll talk about goal setting because, again, the whole purpose of doing this is to start over, to become a baby tummy, to learn how to eat all over again. Setting goals that are realistic, not these goals that are far-fetched, like I'm going to my daughter's wedding in three weeks and I want to be a size six. That's not going to happen. We want to set goals that are realistic. That is the whole purpose of going through this surgery. So the journal is imperative, at least as, as I said in the beginning. And there's many ways to keep a journal. Nowadays with these new iPhones, you can do it on an iPhone. You can keep a little notebook, whatever it takes, just so long that you keep some kind of record of how much protein, how much water, and the feelings you're experiencing so that you can be successful after the surgery. As I said in goal setting, it's real important for you to feel strongly about how you have made this choice. I know you've done a lot of research. There's a lot of research out there. The internet is full of information, but it's also full of disinformation. So make sure that you are sure about what you're doing and that you have made the right choice. Reasonable goals are, none of us are all going to look like Cindy Crawford, of course that's my era, or Arnold Schwarzenegger, but, and that's my era. But whatever your goal is, make sure it's realistic. We're not going to become the size 6 sweet little 16. We're not 16 anymore, many of us. So therefore, it's important to have realistic goals. Goals that you will feel confident about who you are and what you are after this surgery. And then again, setting specific goals. Say I'm going to work out every day is totally unrealistic. Saying that I'm going to work out by 6.30 by walking to the mailbox that morning. And for three days, I'm going to walk to that mailbox. Then the next day, I'm going to walk to the neighbor's mailbox. Being very specific about your goals will help you be successful. Setting unrealistic goals will not work. And that's the whole purpose of the surgery, is to start over and get ourselves back in shape. Planning, planning your goals, how you're going to do it. I have found that if you're going to work out, it's always important to try to set a time frame. Because if you say, I'm going to work out today, you might decide to have your root canal, or your hair done, or your pedicure. A number of things can come in the way. Setting a realistic time. If you're a morning person, make your workout first thing. If you're an evening person, then after work. But making a realistic goal so that you're not constantly setting yourself up for failure. The biggest problem I have seen in the support of this surgery is the support you have from other people. Your um, 
how would we say the the support group your your significant other your work your work partnerships if you have a significant other or a husband or wife or boyfriend girlfriend who are not supportive of you this can cause more problems than necessary i have sat in a class where i had a man sit here and tell me that every time he gained five pounds his wife came home and fried chicken well that didn't work for him i had another couple who was he was a very handsome tall good looking man just big his wife was a true trophy wife, beautiful, nails, hair, the whole nine yards. All she kept doing through the surgery was say, oh, this is going to ruin my life, this is not going to work, how am I ever going to do this? Well, this poor man, no matter what surgery he had, if he didn't have her support, he was going to fail. My ultimate example is the patient who came in and had a gastric bypass, and when she was first introduced to some food, her significant other brought in McDonald's french fries and a Coke. I don't know about you, but I cannot avoid McDonald's fries. They're amazing. So here she took a bite of the fry, a sip of the Coke with the straw, carbonation, and went into so much vomiting that she was had to be intubated. We had to put a tube down her, and then we had to come in and write the nutrition support in the veins. So again, support is everything. If you work with people who are constantly trying to sabotage you, in other words, if you have potlucks every time you turn around, and if you cannot avoid what they're presenting you, then again, this can be a huge sabotage. Have an answer ready. If your coworkers are not aware of what you're doing, then you must have a one word answer or a one line answer so that you will not fail. They will sabotage you. They don't mean to, but that's just human nature. So it's real important, again, having a support group. There are many blogs online, there are support groups. Dr. Umbach has a great program here. In fact, his psychologist, I believe, had the surgery. So if you can get online and get the support you need, you will be successful. So again, keep your goals realistic and keep the people around you to support you. That is what is most important. There are various types of surgeries. Of course, there's a gastric bypass that has been around for quite some time. The lap band, very successful. But again, if you choose to not follow what you've learned during the time of weight loss, you can gain the weight back. The sleeve is a newer procedure, very popular. It does the job too, but again, it shrinks the stomach, but until you learn to re-eat, learn how to eat properly, the weight can come back. And then the rose is also a new procedure out. These procedures all work, but the bottom line is, they are done in about 30 to 40 minutes to an hour. They shrink your stomach to the size of an Easter egg or small banana. But if you do not learn how to eat in that window when you are losing weight, the weight can come back. And we have seen that over and over. So that is why the journal helps setting goals and being surrounded by people that will take care of you and make sure that you are succeeding, not failing. There are several steps before surgery that we'd like to talk about. If you are smoking, you definitely want to stop. Smoking is hard in many ways, of course. We've all read all the articles. But one of the main things is when you lose weight, you're going to lose weight rather rapidly and you need your skin to be well hydrated so that your skin doesn't hang like one of those puppy dogs that have those skin hanging on their face. So you want to stop smoking. You definitely want to exercise. There's no way around it. Wish there was. If I could think of a way, I'd tell you today. Exercise is imperative. Even if it just means walking, taking a can of peas and corn and moving your arms, whatever it is, but you do need the movement. This is going to help tone your skin after the surgery so that it's not all hanging and dangling. The whole purpose of this is to be healthy. So of course, we're going to talk about changing your eating habits. One of the things we talk about a lot is chewing the food slowly. If you've ever watched people at a buffet, and this is Vegas, Las Vegas, um, we have seen people go to buffets and they're on their third and fourth plate and that food is flying. I've raised four kids, two boys, who could put the food down incredibly fast. Well, they may need the calories, but most of us don't. My son's a semi-pro cyclist, and of course he needs five to 6,000 calories on his off day. So needless to say, we can put in that many calories that quickly. So slowing down, chewing, chewing. By chewing slowly, what happens is you give the gut time to tell the brain, hey, I'm full. You take a baby, you put it in your arm, and you feed it with a bottle. The baby takes the bottle, you burp it, the baby's fine. But if you put that bottle back in the baby's mouth again, that baby's going to regurgitate or throw that bottle all back down the side of the back. 
The thing is, you cannot push more food than we need. But eventually, as we get older, our stomach learns to expand and tolerate the food. Slowing down, chewing slowly. Also, what chewing slowly will do is help you from taking in large bites and putting them in that very small tummy you have now. Imagine your tummy is only the size of an Easter egg, and if you gulp something down that hasn't been chewed, that's going to be painful. You want to eat protein first. Protein is one of the most important parts of the diet after the surgery. If you do not get the adequate protein, you will lose your hair. I've had many patients sit in the room and tell me that they have had the surgery before and they didn't get adequate protein and they did have hair loss. So unless you like the bald look, definitely get your protein in. But even if you do like the bald look, you want to stay well nourished. The whole purpose of this surgery is to become a healthy person again. If you do not get the protein in, you can become malnourished. If you think back to the miners that were in Chile a few years ago that were stuck down in the mines for quite some time, they lived on only two ounces of protein a day in order to survive until they were rescued. Their body learned to compensate, but at least they got the protein and they were doing two ounces of tuna. If you do not get the protein, you become malnourished. We have seen patients who have had the surgery 10 years ago that didn't get enough protein in and became malnourished. Their intestines were almost paper thin. We equated it to the studies that we saw in Germany during the World War II with the concentration camp victims. A concentration camp victim didn't die overnight, they slowly starved. What happened is their intestines became, and all their body parts became very malnourished. And their intestines, when they did autopsies later, felt that they looked like wet newspaper, they were so thin. We have seen patients who have had surgery 10 years ago or more, and they have not eaten enough protein, and now every time they eat, they're constantly having ruptures because of the fact that their intestines are so thin from being malnourished. So even, so, even though a person may be overweight or very obese, they can still be malnourished because they didn't get adequate protein. So you will hear me say in this presentation over and over again, the importance of protein. And later on, I will show you how to calculate the protein. Also, the journal, the very first thing we talked about, the journal will help you keep track of the protein so that you make sure you get the nutrition you need. You'll avoid starchy food, at least initially and for the first few months, until you feel you can handle it. Now, some people can never put the starches back in their diet. They have a hard time with them. They have what you may call a obsessive compulsive behavior with them. But most of us can if we learn the right quantities and we will talk about quantities. Fluid is the most important thing too to consider because of the fact that we need to stay hydrated. Becoming dehydrated is one of the number one causes of emergency room visits. So you will be encouraged to drink water. You will not feel thirst, so drinking the water is very important. Also, you will be sipping the water, not drinking it through a straw. If you gulp the water through a straw, it's going to cause some excess air in that little bitty Easter egg tummy you have, and that can cause discomfort. So you will be sipping on water throughout the day. But about before the meal, about 20 to 30 minutes before the meal, you'll hold off on the water, and then that's when you will eat then resume the water about 20 minutes later. So the water is imperative. And again, the journal, the very first thing we talked about, the journal will help you keep record of you getting enough water in your diet. We'll talk about measuring food. I'll show you ways to measure food so that when you go back out in that real world, you'll know how much to eat and how you can still get what you want, but in the quantity that will, you will need. Alcohol is out initially. If you drink alcohol right after the surgery, you're a cheap drunk. You do not have enough calories to sustain you, so you will definitely not be able to handle alcohol. Carbonated beverages, it has gas. Those little bubbles in your tummy, that would hurt. Caffeine, it's not so much the caffeine that's the problem, is the fact that it's dehydrating. So if you're a coffee drinker, you may want to start thinking about cutting back a little bit. I'm not saying you'll take caffeine totally out of your diet, but initially, it'll be more important to get the water and the protein in before you start putting the caffeine in. So caffeine will be put on hold. So if you're a big coffee drinker, start working on that now before you get ready for that surgery. Fruit juices, you don't start your baby with a bottle of straight apple juice. You'll water it down. You won't be able to tolerate even this regular natural sugar 
in your stomach in that concentration. You'll have to water it down. So sweetened drinks, of course, fast food, snack food, you just won't be able to handle. So those things are going to be out of your diet. And that's how the weight comes off. We will take away foods that we have put in our diet for many years and the weight will come off. After the surgery, it's imperative that you take your vitamin. Dr. Umbach has a list of multivitamins and calcium and other supplements that you can take. Vitamins are imperative. There's no way when we cut your calories down to the number that you're going to be getting, somewhere around 800, 1,000 calories, there's no way you can meet the recommended dietary allowances. There's no way you'll get the vitamins in, so you'll have to take a supplement. And nowadays, actually for the last 10 years, the American Medical Association and some of the journals of Medical Association have talked about the importance of, taking, of all of us taking a vitamin anyway. So you will be taking a vitamin. However, you won't be doing the big capsules that you're used to or what we call horse pills. They'll need to be either in a liquid form or a chewable form. And again, you can buy these products through Blossom Bariatrics. To prepare for surgery now, it's good to go ahead and start a food journal. Not everyone is going to have the surgery in the next morning. Depending on what type of surgery you're having, you may have to wait a few months based on your insurance company's requirements. So starting a food intake record is really important. This will again help you find out what you're eating and what is actually going in your mouth. If you're a chocoholic and you take one bite and can't stop, again, this will help you in the future to see that these are foods you need to put away until you are ready to handle them again. Very important before the surgery to do some deep breathing. To breathe in, breathe out. Let your air get in your lungs and totally inflate. Anytime you're having any type of surgical procedure, you want your lungs to be totally able to handle any type of mild sedation. And by doing deep breathing, that will help. So smile. You're doing something great for yourself and now we're ready to take that journey. I like to talk about this for just a minute because sometimes I think we forget that food can be an addiction. I've worked with many patients and over the years I have seen all types of addiction. I had a patient come to me and told me she was abstinent for 20 years. Well my thought was that she hadn't had any alcohol. She hadn't had any flour or sugar for 20 years. Well if that's what helped her keep from becoming obese or in her case, it would flip her back into anorexia. So again, addiction transfer is real important. Another patient I had who had come to me, his insurance required that he come for 12 months. Well, for the first four months, he kept gaining weight. And I'm like, okay, what are we doing wrong here? We talked about it, talked about it. Finally, in about the fifth month, he admitted to me he was a recovering alcoholic. So he was replacing the food for his alcohol. So we got him back into one of his sponsors and into his recovery program and he got back on track. There's a lot of addictions out there so make sure that you're being honest when you do your psychological eval that you will have to do prior to the surgery that you are honest and upfront because again we'll shrink that stomach in just a few minutes to the size of an Easter egg or a small banana but it, we got to get inside the head and fix any problems that are there or the weight could come back. Of course, this is a nutrition class, so we're going to talk about nutrition. Calories, carbohydrates, protein, fat, the different types of fat. Of course, calories are going to be so limited, and we're going to learn a little bit more about how to calculate calories just by using our hands. So calories are going to be one of the first things we're going to cut dramatically. Carbohydrate. Well, a lot of us do a lot of starches and a lot of sugars. Those are going to be cut way, way back. Hence, the reason why a lot of patients who are diabetics have to cut their medicine completely out or at least cut it way back. Your carbohydrate intake will be greatly decreased. But remember, as I said in the beginning, protein, protein, protein. You've got to get your protein in. Protein is the building block of the body and if you do not get your protein in, you become malnourished. Fat is essential, but again, we tend to way overdo the fat. Several types of fats, you've seen the commercials on TV and all the ads saturated, trans fat, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated. Bottom line is you're going to be cutting the fat so dramatically back in your diet that that is what is also going to help you lose weight. Cholesterol is a big, big concern. However, in this diet, you're going to be getting so minimal fat, you will also be getting minimal cholesterol. A lot of patients have been able to get off their cholesterol medications after having the procedure. So when I talk about the egg being the most 
important source of protein or the most recognized source of protein with its amino acid composition. Do not worry about your cholesterol. You will not be getting in enough cholesterol to worry. This is a slide I want you to really burn in your brain because this is how we get the weight off. To lose one pound a week, you reduce your caloric intake by 500 calories a day. It takes 3,500 calories to lose a pound a week. So something as simple as two regular Pepsis a day above what you need, that's 500 calories. One of those chocolate, double chocolatey, froppy things at, at Starbucks or any of the fancy gourmet coffee shops can be as much as 500 calories. So again, people drinking this all day long, the weight can come on. So when you start on this, after the surgery, you're gonna be drinking shakes that are only, you're only gonna get about 800 calories a day. You're used to taking in about 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 calories. Do you see how the weight is gonna come off quickly? You're gonna cut your caloric intake down a lot, but after a while, the body learns to slow down. Remember the concentration camp victims in World War II? They didn't die the next day. They died slowly because their body slowed down. You will slow down. Your metabolism will slow down. And therefore, your body will get used to being on only 800 to 1,000 calories a day. That's why diets fail. You plateau. So how do we push ourselves over that plateau? That's where the exercise comes in. When your elliptical is saying you're only doing 200 calories, then maybe you need to bump it up to 300 calories. I talked about a patient of mine that I'm still working with who started out at about 700 pounds. He's now down to 350, actually 343 the last visit. At one point in my office, he came in at 350 and he had plateaued. When we looked at what he was doing, he was taking in about 1,200 calories a day, which is what he needed at the time. The problem was he was walking and he wasn't getting enough exercise. So we had to, he's a very muscular man, so we had to up the exercise so that we could push that, get closer to expending the extra 500 calories a day so he could start losing weight again. So our bodies are amazing. They will slow down to the number of calories you give them after a while. Now again, you're gonna go from maybe take, most of us women need about 1,800 calories a day, men about 2,000, 2,200, but most of us are eating somewhere between three, four, maybe 5,000 calories a day. So when you start taking the shakes and you start cutting your caloric intake way, way back, yes, the weight's gonna come off real quick for quite some time, but eventually the body will slow down. And to understand this slide, the importance of the weight, the 500 calories a day less than what you need so that you can start that weight loss going again. Two weeks before the surgery, you will do pro two protein shakes a day. And then you will do one lean and green meal, which basically means a small piece of protein with some vegetables. Now that's what you do before the surgery. Dr. Umbach would like you to start this immediately after first getting excited and ready to start preparing for the surgery. Now two weeks after the surgery, you will basically be just on the shakes. You won't be able to get the total amount of protein in initially, so don't panic. But that's why the journal will help you keep record of how much protein you're getting. You will do, two sh you'll do the shakes throughout the day, and then two weeks after surgery, you will meet back with Dr. Umbach or your doctor in your hometown, and he will allow you then to progress on to soft foods. So again, two weeks prior to surgery, start going on those shakes and the one lean and green meal. After the surgery, it shakes only until two weeks you see the doctor and then he lets you progress on to food. This is a slide that will help you remember how much protein is per ounce. Now for the women, you need about 60 grams a day to maintain proper functioning. Men, more around 80. And in our society, we always think more is better. It's not. We do not want to overdo protein. You can cause kidney complications. I see this all the time. As Americans and other cultures, we tend to really push protein to the point where we're doing a 12 ounce T-bone three times a week and we cannot tolerate it. I get a lot of kidney patients in and the first thing we talk about is cutting protein. You need about 60 grams a day for the women, 80 grams for the men. Well, if you can look at this slide and think about it, if in the morning, you, st you know, the doctor has now released you off your shakes and you're able to get in one egg, maybe one egg, because that's all you have room for, that's only seven grams. 
And then at lunchtime, you're only able to maybe get in one to two ounces. That's only another 14. Now we're only up to 21 grams and the day is over. There's no way you're going to get to the 60 grams. Hence, you will stay on the shakes. That is why the journal is so important. This will help you tally your protein. Now you don't have to, it's not an exact science. You don't have to hit 60 every day or your hair is automatically going to fall out. It's a guideline. So this is a slide that will help you remember how much protein is per ounce. As I said, you will stay on the shakes until you can get your protein to the 60 grams for women, about 80 grams for men. And again, those are guidelines, but you just got to make sure you're getting somewhere around that area and the food record will help you with those numbers. Protein will help keep your hair and again, the oxygen and waste movement of nutrients throughout the body. Please eat the protein first. When you start sitting down to your little plate now, you are using a small plate. You put a little bit of cut up chicken, a little bit of mashed carrots and little applesauce. Don't start with the applesauce. You start with the protein because you're going to fill up. You won't believe it at first, but you will. I had a patient where I took the tray in her room and when I opened the lid and showed her three little souffle cups, cups, one of chicken, one of some carrots and one of some applesauce. She said, oh, that's not enough food. I said, I'll be back. I came back in 30 minutes and she was crying because it was the first time she had felt fullness in years that she could even remember. So she knew then how important it was to always eat the protein first. Not eating the protein first, you will fill up on the other foods. And again, remember the malnutrition we talked about. The acceptable carbs that you will be using initially in the diet will only be fruits and vegetables. They will not be all the starches, the pastas, the rice, the potatoes. It will be a, fruits and vegetables will be, be your carb source. The fat will basically be what is in the meat itself. So you will not be adding extra fat. You will not be putting butter on your vegetables. This would cause very strong stomach discomfort. So as you see here, the slide says reach for 60, basically for the women, 80 grams of protein a day for the men, roughly around that area. This is real important to stay healthy. Again, the whole purpose of this surgery is to regain your health and to be healthy once again so that you can live the life you want to live. Now, many people come to me afterwards and tell me that they're sick of protein. What can they do to make it taste better? Simple things as cottage cheese, eggs, yogurts. It doesn't have to be in the form of meat, not necessarily. If you do cook meat, don't overcook it. If you just take a piece of chicken and put it on a pan and stick it in the oven, it's going to taste like shoe leather. Real, real important to marinate it, make it soft so that it tastes good. You wouldn't give your baby a dried up piece of meat. You would chop it up, tenderize it, and make it so that the baby could chew it and stomach it. Crock pots work great. And then of course there's always bariatric cookbooks out there that you can use. Using a baby spoon is very helpful too. A smaller spoon will prevent you from putting large portions of food on your spoon and accidentally not chewing enough and swallowing or gulping and causing stomach discomfort. Avoid fried foods or foods that are very high in calories. This can cause nausea and vomiting. Beans, although are a good source of protein, they do cause gas and gas in a small baby tummy would be very, very painful. Now you may have always been able to drink regular cow's milk. After the surgery, you may not have the hammer or enzyme that will break up the cow's sugar or milk sugar so that you can pass it properly. So some people after the surgery become lactose intolerant. If that's the case, there's various types of milks out there. There's lactate milk, soy milk. Just be careful to read the label because something as rice milk only has one gram of protein. And remember, the whole point is to get protein in the diet. So rice milk would not give you the protein. So why bother at the early stages at this time? So again, be careful with the cow's milk initially just that's what the food record will help the journal will help you decide starches all the breads rices cereals pasta potatoes oats those will be out of your diet for a while they tend to expand in the stomach and they will not help you feel full in fact sometimes they can cause cravings so those will be held out of the diet when you start to add them back in very important to keep a record to make sure they do not cause discomfort 
my favorite patient, the 700 pound gentleman who's now down to 343, still to this day tells me he cannot tolerate rice. It just doesn't settle with him. He still keeps a food record and that is how he knows. So again, when you start adding these foods back into your diet, it's the quantity that really makes the difference. If you put them in large quantities, the weight is going to start coming back on. Now sugars can also cause what they call dumping syndrome, or in other words, a syndrome where there's too much sugar in the stomach, water rushes in, and it can cause diarrhea or vomiting. So you definitely want to avoid foods that have brown sugar, dextrose, maple syrup, molasses, high fructose corn syrup, honey, any of these in the first three ingredients or that have more than 15 grams of sugar per serving can cause dumping. So please be careful when you read your labels. You don't want to put something very sugary. Hence, a can of Coke has 10 packets of sugar in it. Something like that would definitely cause discomfort and dumping syndrome. If you do experience nausea and vomiting, think back. It could be that you ate too fast, your stomach couldn't digest it quick enough, or you ate too much, or maybe it was the wrong foods. Maybe you were pushing foods that you weren't quite ready for. Maybe you didn't chew enough. Maybe one of those pieces got lodged in there and it wasn't able to digest quick enough. And then also sometimes the band can be an issue and that's when you would contact your physician. Make sure that you keep on hand some decaf ginger tea. Now notice I said tea, not ginger ale. Ale has bubbles, it's carbonated. You definitely want to watch that. You may need to return to a softer diet, foods that are easier, softer to digest. Or maybe you need to chew your food more. You might have been not chewing enough to let the body get the food down, the stomach to handle it. Or maybe you pushed your food too fast. One of the things I've noticed over the years working in nursing homes is I will see nurses who are in a hurry. And we will have patients who have a tube feeding, a geriatric older patient who has a tube feeding in their stomach, and the nurses are in a hurry and they will plunge the feeding in as fast as they can because they don't have time to sit there and get that feeding in properly. Well, I always say haste makes waste because exactly what happens to that poor patient when that feeding has been pushed right in there real quick? they experience huge diarrhea. So again, if you push your food in too fast, that can cause nausea and discomfort, vomiting, diarrhea. Using small salad forks and salad spoons and small plates, that too can help you to reduce your portion size. Dr. Umbach wants me to let you know that if you do experience any discomfort or any symptom that you feel you cannot resolve, please contact him or your physician so that you can be admitted to a hospital that is familiar with bariatric procedures. Not all hospitals are certified to handle bariatric procedures. So again, contact Dr. Umbach or the surgeon he asks you to contact. Acceptable carbohydrates before surgery, you can eat all the salad and rabbit food you want. But after the surgery, you're gonna make sure that your vegetables are very soft, no sugar added, cooked well, even canned tend to help, just so that they're mushy and not quite coarse. You won't be doing celery sticks and carrots because you won't be able to tolerate that right after the surgery. You wouldn't start your baby off on a cob salad, so naturally you wouldn't do that right after surgery. You start out with carrots, green beans, soft vegetables that you can chew easily and digest and then progress from there. Sugar-free products are a concern. Many of us drink a lot of sugar-free products Something is crystal light, it's great, it helps with fluid. However, in a large stomach, when your stomach was the size of maybe a baseball, basketball, whatever, um, you could tolerate it. But now it's the size of an Easter egg. So you put a artificial sweetener in a large concentration in that little bitty pouch, you could have total discomfort. So again, your journal will be able to help you decide that. Fats, there's all types of fats. We've all heard them all on TV. Mono, polyunsaturated, hydrogenated, trans fat, saturated. And I have patients who come in the office and go, oh, I only use olive oil. And they hold their hand out and pour and pour and pour to just demonstrate how they use only olive oil. However, whether it's olive oil or lard, it's all 100 calories a tablespoon. So it does add calories. Even though monounsaturated olive oil is good for the heart, it still can go to the hips. So again, limiting fat is very important. Also, you have not had fat in your diet for quite some time. You've been doing shakes, mainly lean proteins and very light carbohydrates. You're not used to the fat. To put a lot of fat in your diet at any one time, 
be sitting near the restroom because you will not feel well quickly. Reading labels is real important. Madison Avenue is notorious for putting labels that are very misleading. So many labels out there can make you think that you're getting a low calorie product. A Pepsi will say that it's 100 calories, but it also says it's for two and a half servings. I doubt many of us share that with two and a half people. So look at the label closely. So when you're trying to decipher how much protein you're getting, make sure you look at the label to make sure you're getting the right number down so that you know how much you're actually getting. Portion sizes are the whole purpose of this surgery. After the surgery, you want to learn how to eat again in the proper amount. A fist is about a cup. You tell me you go to Olive Garden and they only have one fist of pasta on that plate? I highly doubt it. And if you can sit down and knock back three fists of pasta, you're talking 750 calories. Again, that's not even with the meat, the breadsticks, or the salad, and the main course. Remember the slide that talked about 500 calories less a day that we need to lose one pound a week. We really need no more than three ounces of protein at any one time. That is basically the palm of your hand, unless you have hands like Shaq O'Neal. We're talking more like a deck of cards. The palm of your hand is about three ounces. That's all the fish, protein, chicken, fish, meat that we need at any one given time. A thumb is an, about an ounce. An ounce of cheese is 100 calories. So think how easy it is to be at a party or a gathering and have quite a few thumb sizes of cheese. The tip of a thumb is about a teaspoon. So that's 50 calories. So when you go to IHOP and they have pancakes and there's one, two, three, four on top of the first one, you open up the second pancake and there's one, two, three, four. Again, the calories add up very, very quickly and how much fat calories you're getting. Of course, they tell us that an ounce of snack food is all we really need. So not many of us sit down and watch a football game with just a small handful of food. The bottom line is after the surgery to learn how to limit the quantity that you're eating. And if you're eating because the TV tells you to eat, again, the weight will come back on. So decide what is true hunger and what is just truly feeding, something that we're just trying to overcome. If you're a stress eater, are you a person who eats when you're angry, you're happy, you're sad? Um, if you're a TV watcher, it's amazing. The commercials make you want to stop at Jack in the Box on the way to McDonald's. The food all looks so good. Again, pay attention to what's really triggering your hunger. The whole purpose of this surgery is to get to the bottom of how we got here in the first place. As babies, again, we only ate what we needed, and if you put more in us, we would have put it all back down your back. Now we've got to learn to start over. And so therefore, if it's the TV that's causing us to eat, if we're bored, if we're restless, what are we feeding? Get to the bottom of it. This is your window of opportunity. The weight's going to come off and it's going to come off fast. We have to learn in that window how to keep it from ever coming back. Learning portion control, using your hands when you go out to eat, one fist of pasta or potatoes, all you need. The hand can put over your steak. That's all you need. You pack it up and take it home. Again, getting to the bottom of this whole situation. The journal will help you so that you can make sure that you stay on track. You don't want to go through this again. You, went, you made a big decision to have this surgery. We want to make sure we succeed. Alcohol calories can be deadly. A margarita can run as much as 740 calories. So you go out to eat Mexican food and you have two margaritas, chips, and guacamole, you're over 2,000 calories before the entree ever showed up. Remember my slide about 500 calories more a day than we need? This is what happens. One of my favorite stories is about the, the big enjoyment of Red Bull and vodka for a while. Uh, people were coming to the ER, going out to nightclubs and pounding Red Bulls and vodkas. Well, a shot of vodka is just a shot, a small jigger, is about 115 calories. I've had patients tell me they did 10 shots. That's 1,000 plus calories. There you go. Again, with that 500 calorie slide, the weight will come on. Watch your alcohol calories. If you are a drinker, put it back in in moderation. The calories can add up and cause the weight to come back. Protein supplements, this is the product that Dr. Unbox sells. It's called Bariatric Advantage. What we were looking at the most important components of it is that it has to be a whey protein isolate powder. It has to have about 20 grams of protein or more, 3 grams or less of sugar, and 2 grams of less of fat. 
Also, I highly recommend you getting an unflavored protein powder. This tends to help because if you just pick chocolate or strawberry, two weeks of this is going to be tiring. So again, have that unflavored. Therefore, you can add berries or bananas or other fruits to it to give it different flavors. Um, bars work too. They have about 20 grams of protein, less than 250 calories, and less than about 10 grams of sugar. So there's products out there that this is what will help you after the surgery to meet your protein needs. Fluid, very important to get at least 64 ounces of fluid a day. Make sure that you pay attention to the amount of fluid you drink. Again, the food journal will help you with that. If you notice that your urine is very dark, if you have dry, sticky mouth, sunken eyes, dry skin, and I call this the hangover feeling, the headache, irritability, and vomiting, it is because you are dehydrated. Number one admission after surgery to ERs. Please make sure you get your fluid in and your little journal will help. It'll help you make sure you're getting the adequate fluid you need. You will definitely need to take your vitamins after the surgery for the rest of your life. You cannot stop. This is imperative. You will need the nutrients to help you keep your body healthy. Vitamin and mineral deficiencies are preventable just by taking those vitamins. So get you a pill pack or some type of mechanism that will remind you to take your vitamin daily. Fiber is also necessary after the surgery too. You will need at least 25 grams of fiber a day. However, most of us don't get that on a daily basis. So after the surgery, with our food intake being so low, we won't be able to get the adequate fiber in. Fiber is very important for slowing glucose absorption. It reduces certain types of cancer. It adds bulk. Um, it also helps take time to chew. So therefore, it helps to satiety. It slows you down. Fiber is an important part of the diet. However, we will not be able to get adequate fiber in. So therefore, you may need to use something such as a yogurt fortified with fiber or Metamucil, Citrusil, etc. to help you get the fiber you need. Probiotics is another component of the nutrition aspect that you may need to use. We have supplements available here with Dr. Umbach. But you can also get the live cultures in live culture active yogurt. Menu reading is important. Once you get back out there in the real world, it's important that you know how to read a menu. If something is Alfredo, au gratin, batter dipped, honey dipped, tempura, creamy, crispy, it's going to be high in fat. You definitely don't want to put that in your diet. You want to stick with simple, baked, broiled, marinara, grilled types of meats. If you're not sure, ask your chef and he can tell you what's in the food. When you go out to eat, Make sure you know what is in the food you're eating. If it's a high fat product, you could set yourself up for stomach discomfort and embarrassment. You won't be able to handle that amount of fat. Make sure you pick dishes that are simple and easy to digest initially. Food safety is very important. After the surgery, you have a very small stomach. It's the size of a baby's tummy. You want to make sure that you avoid any type of foodborne illness. Make sure that the place that you eat out in has sanitary procedures in place. Food safety, this slide will also show you the temperature that you must get your meat to or your proteins to in order to prevent any type of salmonella, E. coli, or any type of foodborne illness. As I mentioned earlier, exercise is extremely important. It helps control blood pressure, blood sugar, it lowers the risk of disease, and it does help speed up that metabolism so that you can keep that weight off and feel better. So again, find something you enjoy and put it in your lifestyle. This is gonna be the new you. You are now have a small baby tummy and you're putting in very minimal food. So be prepared that if you do not have a regular bowel movement that you have been used to, ever since you were a little child, it may be a little different. That's okay. However, if you feel discomfort and you feel those pangs of constipation, then you may need some additional help. But also walking or some type of activity, water, and getting a fiber supplement will help you. And this will help you feel good so that you can continue on your road to success. Dumping syndrome, I hope you never experience, but if you do, it basically comes in the form of nausea, diarrhea, weakness, abdominal pain, bloating, sweating, lightheadedness. It is because you put too much sugar or too much fat in this very small little pouch and this water fluid rushed in and now you have this syndrome. Lie down, rest, just let the symptoms resolve. Look back in your journal and look what you ate and hopefully avoid this so that you will not experience it again. Most people tell me they only did this once and they didn't do it again. If you follow what we discussed today, keeping a journal, 
getting adequate protein, meeting your fluid needs, you will be successful. That food record will help you on your road to success. I'm Marilyn Anders, registered dietitian, and I wish you all a healthy, happy life.